A Liberation Music Therapy in Practice 2. Theoretical Foundations of Liberation Music Therapy In my last post, we discussed the idea of liberation music therapy, specifically how it could be integrated through liberation theory and equity-focused practices to investigate the relations between music therapy, mental health, and socio-political systems and associated behaviors. Music can elevate marginalized voices, address intergenerational trauma, and facilitate healing and empowerment through creative expression and community cooperation. Theoretical Foundations Liberation music therapy is not a specific orientation, but rather a way of being and a process of a music therapy practice that centers principles of justice, empowerment, and cultural consciousness in the traditions of liberation psychology, community music therapy, and other socialist therapeutic practices and analysis. A liberation orientation centers on socio-political, systemic, and situational forces that contribute to marginalization of mental health using music for expression, reflection, and community building. Practitioners support people and communities in reclaiming their agency and voice, challenging oppressive systems, and advocating for their rights and well-being. Liberation Music Therapy draws from an ever-expanding list of theoretical orientations and modalities involving diverse schools of thought and practice. Developing a critical consciousness can support the healing process of psychological, emotional, and social wounds, build resilience and mend social relationships and solidarity towards a healthier world. Liberation Psychology Liberation psychology forms the foundation of liberation music therapy, stressing the need to understand and address the social, political, and economic contexts that shape the individual and collective experiences. This approach critiques traditional psychology, for often neglecting the broader, the broader systemic factors that contribute to personal and communal challenges. It aims to center on the root causes of colonization, oppression, and marginalization, and the psychological and social wounds that can result from them. A key concept in liberation psychology is critical consciousness, also known as conscientization, or the raising of awareness regarding structural inequalities and social injustices. A more informed understanding allows individuals and communities to identify systematic oppression and mobilize efforts to challenge and change these conditions. Empowerment helps marginalized groups reclaim their narratives. Liberation psychology emphasizes the process of de-idealization, de um, which involves unpacking and dismantling hegemonic ideologies and critical examining the cultural, social, and political norms that maintain marginalization. In prolonged oppression, oppressed groups unconsciously internalize the oppressor's guidelines and behaviors, becoming a part of their oppression and developing a complex feeling of inadequacy. Individuals and communities can begin to separate from the processes of internal Internalization of the psychology of oppression and objectification that reinforce subjugation. So uh, deconstruction and understanding of unhealthy ideologies is paramount for building a just and equitable society. The preferential option for oppressed groups emphasizes the necessary commitment to prioritizing the needs and voices of those who have been historically marginalized. Uh, creating participatory and inclusive practices that center these community experiences and perspectives. Direct involvement in the therapeutic process provides a space for validating participants' experiences and empowers them to take an active role in their individual and community healing and liberation. Liberation Theology 
where liberation psychology offers foundational insights into the mental and social needs of the oppressed classes, liberation theology offers a spirituality-focused preferential option for the poor and oppressed, as well as spiritual healing and support. Emerging from the 1960s and the 1970s, particularly in Latin American Catholicism after the Second Vatican Council, liberation theology emphasizes the liberation of the oppressed. It engages in socioeconomic analysis, addressing various forms of inequality and advocating for political liberation for oppressed peoples. Uh, so theologians such as Gustavo Gutierrez, a prominent advocate of liberation theology, stresses that authentic spirituality cannot be separated from the struggle for justice and calls for a commitment commitment to the marginalized and oppressed. Gutierrez emphasizes the interconnectedness of spiritual and social liberation, asserting that individual spirituality is intrinsically linked to the broader struggle for justice. Liberation theology posits that addressing systemic inequalities is a moral imperative, urging participants to confront and dismantle the structures that perpetuate inequality and suffering, that faith should actively promote social transformation. Decolonial thought. Franz Fanon and Amy Cesare, uh, their contributions to decolonial thought examined the persuasive, pervasive influence of colonialism on the thinking, organization, and existence of colonized people. They argue that decolonization extends beyond the mere end of colonial rule, encompassing epistemic, political, and ethical dimensions and involving the active process of unlearning the coloniality of power, knowledge, and being. So decolonial thought aims to empower the colonized to center their experiences and perspectives without seeking validation from the colonizer. Decolonial thought aligns with many black and indigenous liberation movements in history and the present day, emphasizing the dismantling of racial hierarchies and the restoration of cultural identities disrupted by colonialism. The recognition of the lumpen proletariat, also known as the marginalized underclass within capitalism, is central to this theory and was a central theory of revolutionary groups like the Black Panther Party and the Young Lords. By critiquing the Eurocentric worldview perpetuated by colonial powers, movements can center on ad advocating for the revitalization of indigenous cultures and knowledge systems. Movements should support neo-indigenous cultures in their liberation processes and the recovery of traditional practices to restore dignity and autonomy. Decolonialism intersects with various abolitionist movements, such as the abolition of prisons and the efforts to end slavery and human trafficking, with the aim to dismantle institutions perpetuating racial, class, and social inequalities. Critical Psychology Critical psychology pulls from critical theory, uh, is a school of thought that aims to analyze and reframe the assumptions, theories, methodologies of mainstream psychology. It emphasizes the importance of considering social and structural factors, such as power dynamics and discrimination, that particularly impact mental, physical, and social health. Inclusivity and sensitivity in psychological research and practice are prioritized in research and practice by applying psychological insights critically practitioners can find ways to advocate for social progress and understand broader societal issues, particularly those related to the psychopathology of colonization and the dominance of capitalism. 
The central focus of critical psychology is the recognition of structural inequality, institutional bigotry, and discrimination, the impact of colonialism and hierarchy, and the role of social forces such as power and influence in contributing to mental health disparities. Mainstream psychology has historically overlooked broader systemic issues, concentrating on individual behavior, internal processes, and dispositional aspects of causality and action. This focus reflects the social values of a distinct social class. This social position creates a challenging bias to overcome even when the information is reliable. This narrow focus can inadvertently reinforce societal inequalities and fail to address the root causes of psychological distress embedded in social hierarchies and power imbalances. Critical psychology advocates for the exploration of alternative methodologies that encounter or account for the intersectionality of social identities, including aspects such as class, gender, race, age, ethnicity, body type, religion, sexual orientation, and disability. The objective is to understand how multifaceted aspects of identity can influence people's experiences and perspectives within societal contexts. Critical Pedagogy Critical pedagogy is a philosophy of education and a social movement that integrates concepts from critical theory and relates traditions into the field of education and cultural studies. Its primary focus is on developing learners' critical consciousness to analyze and challenge power and structures, inequalities and discrimination, aiming to liberate individuals from oppression. Key figures like Paulo Freire and Bell Hooks have critiqued the banking model of education, where learners passively receive knowledge, arguing that it stifles critical thinking and dehumanizes both students and teachers. Instead, they propose a problem-posing education based on dialogue, where learners actively engage in problem-solving, and both teachers and students are co-learners. This approach fosters participatory and dialogical education, empowering marginalized individuals to challenge and transform oppressive structures and promoting critical thinking, active engagement, and social justice to create a more equitable and democratic society. Critical pedagogy can significantly influence psychoeducation practice, the evidence-based educational intervention that supports individuals and their loved ones in managing mental health conditions. By creating a collaborative and an inclusive environment, it encourages participants to examine the social, political, and economic factors concerning their mental health. Critical psychoeducation can provide essential information and skills such as problem solving and communication in a supportive environment. Critical pedagogy integrates cultural sensitivity and a holistic perspective addressing individual mental health needs within the context of broader systemic issues and leading to more sustainable healthy living. Community Music Therapy Community music therapy emphasizes the collective and social dimensions of therapeutic music making, focusing on community empowerment and social change. It recognizes the profound therapeutic potential of shared musical experiences, fostering solidarity, cultural expression, and collective resilience. By engaging in communal music making, participants can break down social barriers, enhance understanding and empathy, and create a supportive environment where everyone's voice is valued. Cultural expression plays a crucial role as music serves as a medium for conveying, conveying cultural heritage and identity, allowing individuals to reclaim and strengthen their cultural identities. Additionally, community music therapy can catalyze social action, encouraging active participation in community life and civic engagement through music. Community music therapy can be understood as a social movement due to global conditions during its emergence and its focus on cultural plurality.
poverty, economic crisis, and the restructuring of health and social care services. It has inspired broader and more adaptable practices, critiques traditional theories, and serves as a platform for exploring interdisciplinary approaches and interprofessional dialogue. The music therapist facilitates and supports musical activities while being attuned to the group's social and emotional dynamics. The Psychopathology of Colonialism the psychopathology of colonialism examines the psychological impacts of colonial domination, which has been shown to lead to mental disorders such as depression, anxiety, and PTSD through violence, dispossession, and cultural suppression, resulting in alienation and identity fragmentation. The revolutionary struggle against colonialism offers therapeutic potential by promoting psychological health through resistance and reclaiming cultural identity, decolonizing the mind, rediscovering indigenous knowledge systems, and fostering pride and agency. This process confronts and dismantles colonial structures, achieving psychological liberation and well-being through collective action, addressing immediate psychological wounds, and breaking the cycle of transgenerational trauma for long-term healing and resilience. Sociotherapy. Sociotherapy emphasizes the social dimensions of mental health, centering on the role that community and social networks play in the healing process. Unlike traditional therapeutic models focused on the individual, sociotherapy considers the broader social context, leveraging relationships and communal support to help mental health. It tackles issues such as social isolation, alienation, marginalization, and the lack of supportive networks, creating environments where individuals feel supported and understood. Sociotherapy places social determinants such as poverty, discrimination, and inequality as the underlying causes of psychological distress and seeks to establish fair and just communities. In collaborating with community leaders, organizations, and policymakers, sociotherapy can support systemic changes that improve social conditions. It emphasizes engaging individuals in community activities and encouraging active participation in their healing process. A holistic approach is both suitable, sustainable, and transformative, allowing comprehensive well-being and long-term community resilience through participatory and inclusive practices. Institutional Psychotherapy. Institutional psychotherapy focuses on creating therapeutic environments with more democratic and participatory structures, shifting traditional power dynamics in mental health institutions. This approach emphasizes collaboration among patients, therapists, and staff, encouraging inclusive and responsive environments where patients actively participate in their treatment. It advocates for flexible, humane, and patient-centered practices, creating open, dialogical spaces that integrate cultural and creative dynamics to validate the cultural identities and nurture community. This holistic approach emphasizes social justice, cultural recognition, and patient empowerment, addressing individual mental health needs while contributing to a broader society change and fostering more resilient and equitable communities. Marxist Humanism Marxist humanism is a perspective within Marxism that emphasizes the humanist aspects of Marxist philosophy, advocating for a society that prioritizes human needs and critiques the alienation inherent in capitalist systems. It treats alienation, a central concept in Marxism, as both a subjective and objective phenomenon, describing a dysfunctional relationship between entities that should be harmonious, thereby preventing individuals from developing their fundamental human capacity capacities. Ultimately, Marxist humanism envisions communism as the reappropriation of human life and the elimination of alienation, emphasizing the creation of a society that fosters human development and well-being, rooted in the genuine aspirations and lived experiences of people. Trauma-informed care. 
Trauma-Informed Care, or Trauma and Violence-Informed Care, is a holistic framework meant to support individuals affected by traumatic events across various environments, including medicine, mental health, law, education, and community work. This approach integrates a biopsychosocial model to shift the focus from what is wrong to you. Sorry. Shift from what is wrong with you to what happened to you. The goal is to create safe, empathetic environments where, uh, that improve understanding and provide better support. Practitioners should modify relational approaches, maintain a mindful presence, and nurture open dialogue. Fundamental principles include ensuring safety, fostering effective communication, and building stability, resilience, and navigation skills. The three-way fight. The three-way fight social theory and framework uh, The three-way fight social theory and framework interprets contemporary political struggles as a tripartite conflict involving revolutionary socialism, neoliberal capitalism, and reactionary chauvinism. Reactionary Revolutionary socialism advocates for radical societal transformation based on equality and democratic control over production, opposing both neoliberal capitalism's free market policies and reactionary chauvinism's exclusionary ideologies. Neoliberal capitalism emphasizes deregulation and privatization, facing criticism for increasing inequality and prioritizing profit over people. Reactionary chauvinism includes far-right populism, nationalism, and fascism, seeking to uphold perceived hierarchies through nationalism and authoritarianism. This framework simplifies the complex interactions and conflicts between these three social forces, each proposing different solutions to issues of power, identity, and justice. Three Class Ladders Theory the three class ladders theory proposes there are three distinct ladders, labor, gentry, and elite, each with four social classes belonging to them and an underclass disconnected from any ladder being generationally poor and not connected to these infrastructures, making up a 13th class. Social class is more sociological than economic. Social class determines how a person is perceived, their access to information, and the opportunities available to them, making it difficult to change one's social class. The labor ladder, about 65% of the population, includes the secondary labor, the primary labor class, the high-skill labor class, and the labor leadership class, representing blue-collar work where status is based on income and work effort. The gentry ladder, representing about 23.5% of the population, consists of the transitional gentry class, the primary gentry class, the high gentry class, and the cultural influencers. This class focuses, sorry, this latter focuses on education and cultural influence rather than income. The gentry values access to reputable institutions and cultural movements, often rebelling against commoditization. And then there's the elite ladder, which is about 1.5% of the population. This includes the strivers class, the elite servants class, the national elite class, and the global the elite owns things and values control and establishment, often exploiting the labor and gentry classes to make 